faces I know in the crowd as well. Um, so yeah, I want to talk to you today about Global Causal Duality, which is um, a project uh, that I was working on joint with Andre, who's also in Lancaster. Um, it's uh, This talk is going to be based on the archive preprint of the same name, which appears at that, uh, that address there. Uh, so the sort of structure of the talk. So firstly, I'm going to talk about my motivation to think about causal duality, which comes from defamation theory. It's going to be kind of brief. Um, and then I'm going to spend some time outlining uh, usual conal potent causal duality. And finally, I'm going to talk about uh, the, the global story, the global causal duality. And I'll say a bit later on why we actually have called it global causal duality. So let's get started um, with some defamation theory. Uh, so what defamation theory roughly is, so it's the study of infinitesimal defamations uh, of geometric objects. So uh, schemes, stacks, vector bundles, things of that uh, that nature. And um, so in order to make this precise, I need to tell you what an infinitesimal is. So ah, um, maybe let me just remark, uh, I'm going to work over a, a fixed, perfect, field k. Uh, some of the stuff I'm about to tell you needs k to be characteristic zero, but for for uh, the results in paper with me and Andre, a fixed perfect field will do. Uh, the reason we need perfectness is because we want to, uh, yeah, so some, some finite dimensional algebra stuff about maximal semi-simple equations. It's not, uh, not terribly important. Uh, so what are the infinitesimals? Um, an infinitesimal is going to be, well, these are the spectra of uh, Artinian local K algebras with residue field K, uh, commutative Artinian, sorry. We're doing algebraic geometry, everything's commutative, with residue field K. So the finite dimensional commutative algebras, uh, which, are, which are local, so in the usual sense. So let me just give you an example. Um, the dual numbers, k epsilon mod epsilon squared is a perfectly good Artinian local ring. And spec of this thing, well, it's got a unique closed point. Um, and you think of it as having a sort of infinitesimal tangent vector attached. So um, as a reduced scheme, if I take the reduction, it's just a point but there's some uh, infinitesimal information. And um, broadly, what deformation theory does, or what sort of um, the sort of formal part of deformation theory does, it studies uh, certain functors from these commutative Artinian local algebras to the category of sets. And uh, so such functors um, are supposed to behave like um, deformations of some geometric object. So in other words, to a um, to a Artinian ring lambda, I associate some set which uh, looks like the set of deformations of some object over lambda. Um, so because this isn't the main thrust of the talk, I don't want to get too deeply into the deformation theory. That would take me at least a full hour if I wanted to do it properly. Um, but this is just uh, motivational. Um, oops, sorry. So it's a philosophy. So this is a philosophy uh, due to Delin in uh, 86, I believe, a famous letter to Goldman and Milson. 
that every defamation problem or defamation functor is controlled by a DG, so differential graded Lie algebra. Um, so I don't want to tell you what I mean by controlled yet, but let me tell you what a DG Lie algebra is. Um, so, so a DG Lie algebra is a graded Lie algebra. Uh, when I say graded, I mean Z graded uh, with a differential D of degree one, satisfying the Leibniz rule. Um, yeah, so that's what a DG Lie algebra is. It's a, it's a chain complex and a Lie algebra um, in a, in both structures are compatible with each other. Um, so this was just a philosophy for sort of 20 years or so. Um, people tried to formalize this in various different ways. And one way of both formalizing this statement and also proving it to be true is to use derived geometry. So uh, one approach, Use derived, use derived geometry. So um, derived geometric objects are uh, locally modeled on commutative differential graded algebras, uh, which are connective, so concentrated in uh, non-negative homological degrees. Um, so yeah, commutative, let me just spell that out for you, connective, differential, graded algebras. Okay, so let me state sort of the most important uh, theorem in this uh, this field. So this is independently due to Laurie and Pridham, um, both around 2010. Um, and the theorem states that there is an equivalence. Uh, and I'm not a lot lie to you, it's, it's an equivalence of infinity categories. Um, between uh, the category of DG Lie algebras and the category of so called formal moduli problems. So, so this is the category of formal moduli problems. So these are certain, uh, well, these are derived versions of deformation functors. And they go from commutative DG Artinian rings, which are connective. And instead of going to a set, because um, we're doing derived geometry, we've got a lot of homotopy theory in the mix now, we go to simplicial sets instead. Um, so maybe um, let me say something more about this. So at a very sort of high level, if you think of this as calculus, so a formal moduli problem is some sort of um, you should think of as some being a bit like a sort of formal Lie group and I can take its tangent space and that's going to be a, a DG Lie algebra. And conversely, if I have a DG Lie algebra, I can always exponentiate at least formally uh, to get some sort of uh, formal Lie group. And that's, that's roughly what's going on. So you should think of this as some sort of calculus. And um, I... 
myself am more interested in non-commutative geometry than commutative geometry. And indeed, there is also a non-commutative version of this statement. So this is a theorem of Lori now. Uh, it, it's in it's in DAG ten, uh, same place as the same place as the previous theorem. Uh, this theorem says that there is an equivalence, again an equivalence of infinity categories. So there's a notion of non-commutative formal moduli problem, which is the same except you use non-commutative Artinian DG algebras instead of commutative ones. Um, and these are equivalent, not to DG Lie algebras anymore, but to DG algebras, uh, which are in addition augmented, uh, meaning that the, the unit morphism admits a retract. And um, very loosely, maybe the analogy is a bit harder to see here, but you can also sort of think of this as some sort of calculus. Uh, Matt? Yeah. Uh you just said about the NCFMP that it's just the non computer version of the usual FMP. Is it just that, or are there some certainties that you are like? Choosing no, it, 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 it pretty much is the same thing. I mean, if if you, it depends how you define FMP. Um, but um, one one definition of formal moduli problems is essentially as functors from commutative Artinian things, uh, which um, are pointed and preserve uh, homotopy pullbacks. And if I just put the word non-commutative in, uh, then that is the definition of the category of non-commutative formal moduli problems. Yeah, thank you. And, okay, so it, it turns out that both of these theorems fit into uh, the same framework. And that framework is causal duality. So if you've seen a bit of causal duality before, you'll know sort of operatic causal duality. You'll know that DG, well, you'll know that the Lie operad is causal dual to the commutative operad. And the associative operad is causal dual to itself. And what we're seeing here is that on the right hand side, these were uh, the type of objects we were deforming over. And on the left hand side, these were the type of objects that were controlling our deformation functors. And in fact, um, sort of the, 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 the formal part or the categorical part of sort of the modern derived approach to deformation theory is just causal duality. Um, uh, again, I wanna say the formal part because once you, once you put in sort of geometric uh, inputs to things, you have to start doing geometry. So, and that's why I became interested in causal duality because it, it gives you the duality between um, deformation functors and their controlling uh, algebras of some kind. Okay, so that is the motivational part of the talk over. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about usual conal potent causal duality. Uh, conal potent. was all duality. Uh, now to do this, I want to start talking about co-algebras. So uh, maybe I'll just give you a very brief reminder of what a co-algebra is. So recall an algebra in a monoidal category, uh, the tensor I is an object A with, well, firstly, a unit morphism, I to A, and secondly, a, a multiplication morphism, A tensor A to A, satisfying unitality 
and associativity. Now, they can be defined in terms of diagrams. Uh, I'm not going to write the diagrams down for you. You'll see why in a second. And so this, this for example, um, encompasses the usual definitions of uh, k-algebras, uh, differential graded k-algebras, uh, various, various other algebras of interest. And what a k-algebra is, is, um, is what you get if you turn around all the arrows in the definition of an algebra. So let me uh, give you the definition of a co-algebra. So a co-algebra in V is an object C with firstly a co-unit morphism from C to the tensor unit. And secondly, a co-multiplication, and it's going to go from C to C tensor C, and we're going to call this uh, capital delta. That's often what's used for co-algebras. And it's going to satisfy uh, two identities. So first, co-unitality. So if we start with C and we co-multiply, I can then apply the unit on the left or on the right, and that should be the same as the identity on C. So that's co-unitality. And second is co-associativity. And this essentially says the three ways, uh, sorry, the, the two ways of getting from, uh, getting ahead of myself, the two ways of getting from C to C tensor C tensor C are the same. So what are the maps in this diagram? Uh, this is the co-multiplication, this is the co-multiplication, this is one tenth of the co-multiplication, and this is the co-multiplication tenths of one. And I'm asking that this diagram should commute. Sorry, I've put in a bracket which shouldn't be there. So that's what a co-algebra is. Um, so I didn't draw the, co the unitality and associativity diagrams for algebras because they're the duals of these diagrams here. And okay, so uh, from now on, um, whenever I say the word co-algebra, I'm going to mean uh, co-algebra in DG vect. So in other words, a, a DG co-algebra. Um, so I, I'm giving you this convention because I'm lazy and I often forget the DG and this confuses people. So uh, this is this is my convention. Everything is DG. Um, maybe just a remark. You can check that if C is a co-algebra, then its linear dual is an algebra. Uh, the converse isn't true. Oh, well, the... the not the converse, but the linear duals of algebras don't need to be co-algebras. Uh, and you'll see if you if you try for yourself dualizing an algebra to get a co-algebra, if the algebra is infinite dimensional, you'll see that there's a natural map, uh, which is not an isomorphism, and it goes the wrong way. Um, so the multiplication doesn't necessarily dualize to a co-multiplication. Um, maybe just a, a sort of a further, further remark on this. Um, so it's a, um, it's a theorem of, well, in the, in the ungraded case, it's due to Swedler, and in the DG case, it's due to Getzler and Gers, that every co-algebra is um actually sorry let me let me state this in more categorical terms uh there's an equivalence between the category of all dg co-algebras and the end the end category of the category of finite dimensional dg co-algebras so this, this is the category of formal filtered co-limits. 
of uh, finite dimensional coalgebras. So you often see this in the in the more um, down to earth formulation that every coalgebra is the union of its finite dimensional sub coalgebras. Uh, but that actually, those those two statements are equivalent. And um, as a as a consequence, if I look at the opposite of the category of DG coalgebras, this turns out to be the same as pro objects in the category of finite dimensional DG algebras. Why is this? Well, finite dimensional algebras and finite dimensional coalgebras are anti-equivalent by the linear dual. This, this isn't hard to see. And uh, when I dualize an in-category, I get a pro-category. So that's effectively why. So if you if you don't like coalgebras, you can view them as certain uh, types of pro-algebras. Or if you like, you can take the limit and view them as sort of a certain topological algebras. And these things are called the pseudo-compact algebras. So uh, going to pseudo-compact things is often a, often a useful way to think, uh, especially if you don't like coalgebras very much. Uh, so let me tell you, let me give you a theorem now. Uh, so this is one of the many, many theorems that goes by the name Kizzle duality. And, um, well, let me just explain sort of the history. So sort of Quillen has a precursor to this theorem, uh, which was extended by Hinnich in the 90s. Um, these are both sort of commutative. Uh, Lefebvre Hasegawa has a version. Sorry, I didn't have enough time, <laughs> enough space to write that. And the uh, the definitive the definitive version of this is uh, you deposit cell scheme. Um, and it says that there is a Quillen equivalence. Uh, between um, the categories of augmented, ah, okay, DG algebras and the category of conilpotent DG coalgebras. Uh, so I haven't told you what a conilpotent coalgebra is. I'll tell you that in a second. Um, so in particular, Uh, both categories are model categories, or well, both categories have model structures. And uh, there exists a quill and a junction between them. So this is this is a theorem with a lot of content. Um, so let me tell you what a what a conal potent coalgebra is. So um, a coalgebra C is co-augmented if the co-unit has a section and then the co-augmentation co-ideal, let's call this epsilon, kernel of epsilon, is then a non-unital co-algebra uh, non co unital coalgebra under, well, something called the reduced co multiplication. In other words, the co multiplication descends to this, uh, to this thing. And in addition, I say that C is co nil potent if for every C in the co augmentation co ideal there exists some N such that if I do the reduced co-multiplication on C a bunch of times, I get zero. Uh, so this is this is the dual uh, of, for what it means, this is the dual of the condition for what it means for an algebra to be nilpotent, right? Nilpotent means if I take an object and I take powers enough powers of it, it goes to zero. And this is precisely uh, the analog for co Um uh, maybe as a remark, I mean, if you've not seen coalgebras before, this is well defined because uh, by co associativity, basically. Okay, so that's what a conal potent coalgebra is. Um, maybe let me give you an example. So if V is a vector space, 
um, has a tensor co-algebra. So this is looks the same as the tensor algebra. So it's k plus v plus the tensor square of v dot dot dot. And what's the co-multiplication? Um, if I have a string v1 up to vn, so in other words, a, a vector in one of the v tensor n's, uh, I define this to be a sum of all possible ways of splitting this tensor up into two smaller tensors. So this is going to be v1 up to vi, tensored with vi up to vn, and I'm summing over i for which this sum makes sense. If I try and write down the indices, I'll get it wrong. Um, and then in fact, the tensor co-algebra on v is the co-free, co-nilpotent uh, co-algebra on v. So it should be pretty clear that this is co-nilpotent. Um, because if I take a tensor of length n and I try and co-multiply it n plus one times, uh, I, I'm not going to get anything, right? There's no way of breaking this up into more than n, uh, n tensor ams. Um, and it is co-free, so um, co-free co-algebras in general do also exist. Uh, they are much harder to work with. Um, yeah, they are They are kind of nasty objects, whereas co-free co-nilpotent co-algebras are... Uh, Nice and tractable. Okay, so um, let me finish this section by actually telling you what the model structures are and what the Quillen junction between them is. So if A is an augmented DG algebra, it has something called a bar construction. BA, so this is a DG co-algebra, and it's the tensor co-algebra on the shifted augmentation ideal of A. Uh, but it's not just that, it has, a, there's a twist in the differential. So the differential has two components, D1 plus D2. D1 is the usual differential. So um, this in particular is a DG vector space. And so this is a DG vector space, the tensor algebra, tensor co-algebra. Um, but there's also an extra term D2, and this is defined using the multiplication on A. So this sends, um, sends a tensor A1 up to AN to a sum, a signed sum. I'm not going to write down the signs because again, I'm going to get them wrong. I do A1, and then I multiply AI with AI plus one, and then I go up to AN. So in other words, I sum over the possible ways of multiplying adjacent uh, uh, adjacent tensor factors. Uh, and, I, and I add a sign according to degree, which again, I'm not gonna, not gonna write down. And you can, you can check that this is a DG co-algebra. Um, I'm not, not going to do it, but you can check. And uh, similarly, a DG co-algebra C or uh, co-augmented has a co-bar construction omega um, well, omega C and this is defined to be the tensor algebra on the shifted co-augmentation co-ideal. I shift the other way now uh, again with a twist and the twist this time incorporates the co-multiplication in a in a completely analogous way. And it's a theorem that omega is left adjoint to B. So bar and cobar are adjoints. Um, so let me give you the proof idea um, because it's going to introduce a couple of things which we'll find useful later. Uh, if C is a co-algebra and A an algebra, then the vector space of linear maps from C to A is also an algebra. So how do I define the co-multiplication? Let's suppose I'm given two maps from C to A. I can go from C to C tensor C using the co-multiplication. 
I can do F in this factor and G in the other. I end up at A tensor A. And I can multiply uh, to go back to A. And this, this turns out to be associative um, because uh, C was co-associative and A was associative. So that's um, the first fact. And then secondly, uh, if E is a DG algebra, the set of Mora Cartan elements uh, of E is the set MC of E. So these are the uh, X in E1 such that dx plus x squared equals zero. Um, so if you know your differential geometry, you may recognize this as the mora cartan equation. So that's where the terminology comes from. And then, um, so you can check that the set of algebra maps from omega c to a is naturally isomorphic to mc elements in this convolution algebra. Now, roughly, why is this? Uh, sorry, I have to take a, I have to take a augmentation ideals there. Uh, roughly, why is this? So, omega c is more or less free on c. So, a map from omega c to a should just be a linear map from c to a. But I also had to twist this differential, and compatibility with this twisted differential translates into precisely the MC equation in the convolution algebra. And very analogously, uh, I can just run this proof on the co-algebra side and see that this is also isomorphic to HOM CBA. Uh, so this establishes, um, this establishes that uh, bar and co-bar adjuncts. So and important for that. Uh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So C, C is conal potent. Um, and A is augmented, yeah. Yeah, so this these HOMs take place in the category of uh, kernel potent or, or just co... Well, yeah. These HOMs take place in the category of co-augmented co-algebras and augmented algebras. Um, and yeah, so finally, let me just tell you about the model structures. So... The model structures are, so one, uh, augmented DG algebras is a model category. The weak equivalences are the quasi-isomorphisms and the vibrations are the surjections. And secondly, uh, the category of Conal potent DG algebras is a model category. The weak equivalences are the maps uh, F such that omega F is a quasi isomorphism. So this is a stronger condition than being a quasi isomorphism. Every such map, every weak equivalence is a quasi isomorphism. The converse is not true. And the co-fibrations are the injections. So that is pretty much everything uh, you need to know about conal potent causal duality. Um, so DG algebras and conal potent DG algebras are both model categories. Uh, the weak equivalences of co-algebras are slightly funny. The weak equivalences of algebras are the usual, well, the usual ones you might expect. And there are bar and co-bar functors which are quillen equivalences. Okay, so that's usual conal potent causal duality. So now in the last sort of 15 minutes, let me explain the non conal potent version. So this is section three, global causal duality. So the goal here is to remove conal potency from the above theorems. And uh, why do we call this 
global causal duality, so conilpotency corresponds on the geometric side to um, formal deformation functors. So our um, deformation functors Uh, on uh, Artinian local things. And essentially, we want to remove this kernel potency, which, which corresponds to doing a, a sort of a globalized version. So uh, all co-algebras should correspond to deformation functors defined on just all Artinian DG algebras uh, without any locality. So in particular, if you think of deformation theory as sort of investigating points in a moduli space, you're allowing sort of points to uh, separate and collide. So this tells you a much, this is a much more global theory. So for example, um, you know, sort of standard test objects are modeled on pro-finite completions rather than um, pro-Artinian completions. So things like uh, the profinite completion of Z rather than the um or, or the affine line maybe rather than um, rather than the complete local affine line. Again, this, this is sort of just motivation. But um let me start by telling you about Bar and Cobo. So actually we we have to use, well, it's best expressed. using curved algebras uh, and curved co-algebras. So let me just tell you what a curved algebra is briefly. A curved algebra uh, is a graded algebra A with a degree one map D and uh, a, a degree two element H such that, well, D squared is not necessarily a differential, but I do have some control over D squared in that it's the commutator with H. And I'm also going to ask that D of H is zero. So curved algebras are generalizations of DG algebras. Um, it's, it's pretty clear that a DG algebra is a curved algebra if I choose H to be zero. Um, but curved algebras are, are not objects typically that have cohomology, right? This is not a chain complex with extra structure. This might not have any sort of reasonable definition of cohomology. Uh, you can also define curved co-algebras. You can define them directly, or you can define them as... Um, this definition here, but I put in the word pseudo compact everywhere. And so there are extended bar and cobar constructions for curved algebras and co-algebras, which I'll sort of outline now. So here's a theorem. So in the uncurved setting, I think this is due to Bernal and Joyal. And I think in the curved setting, this is due to Guan and Lazarev. Um, that there is an adjunction. So, uh, sorry, curved co-algebras. Um, so there's a co-bar construction for curved co-algebras. It works very, very similarly to the co-bar construction I outlined earlier. Um, it's it's very, very similar. It's, it's a tensor algebra on something. Um, so that's that's pretty much the same. And this returns you a curved algebra. Now, there is a right adjunct going the other way. And this is something called the completed bar construction. Now, I don't want to go through the specifics of this because it's a bit, um, bit unpleasant. But loosely, what you do is uh, instead of using the tensor co-algebra, so the co-free, co-nil potent co-algebra, I instead use the free co-algebra. And uh, this, this is a perfectly well-defined thing. It's just harder to work with. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't want to say really much about the specifics. 
um, but there is this perfectly good adjunction. And here's the main theorem, oops, here's the main theorem of our paper. Oh, that's gone off. So this is me and Andre. Um, there is a Quillen equivalence Uh, well, yeah, um, between, come on, between the categories of curved algebras and the category of curved algebras, where the left adjoint is the omega and the right adjoint is the completed, co the completed bar construction. So again, the, the main, the content of this theorem is that both of these categories are model categories. Um, and that this pair of functors is both equivalent to junction and an equivalence on homotopy categories. So let me tell you um, how the weak equivalences are defined. Let me begin by doing that. And they're defined via some auxiliary construction. So if E is a curved algebra, it has uh, an M C D G category, M C sub D G of E. The objects are the Mora Cartan elements of E. So these are the objects. Uh, these are the X in E one, such that D X plus X squared plus H. So the curvature element is zero. And what are the morphisms? So I need to write down a complex of morphisms between any two such elements. Uh, so HOM XY um, is given by uh, something called the two-sided twist. So this is the chain complex uh, whose underlying graded vector space is just E. And the differential, um, the differential on an element E, this is, uh, maybe let me write this down differently. Maybe let me write this with a curly D. The differential of this chain complex on an element E is firstly the differential in the algebra. Um, and let me check the signs. So it's plus Y E my, like minus minus one uh, to the degree of E, E, X. And um, you can check that this is a chain complex. Uh, this is a chain complex because both Y and X are more Cartan elements. And um, yeah, th these chain complexes do fit together into a DG category. So maybe a remark, if you know about twisted modules, MCDG of E is the full subcategory of the twisted E modules on the uh, rank one uh, twisted modules. Uh, if you don't know what a twisted module is, it's not terribly important, um, but it does fit into this uh, more general. I have about five minutes left, right? Oh, yeah, you're muted, Richard. No, that's not why I turned on the camera. I just oh, okay, <laughs> no worries. <laughs> um, yeah, so there's this more and DG category. Sure, this is some auxiliary construction. But this is how the weak equivalences are going to be defined. So, um, so here's the definition. You have, around, you have around 15 minutes left, by the way. 10 minutes. 15. 15. Ah, okay, thanks. Sorry, I thought I thought it was uh I thought it was a 50 minute talk. Okay, great. Uh, so definition. So I say that a morphism A to A prime of curved algebras. Okay, I haven't strictly told you what a morphism is, 
Um, it involves morphism of Kurt algebra also involves a change of curvature. Um, so in particular, DG algebras don't embed fully faithfully into curved algebras. There may be more, but this is a point for those who uh, care about the technicalities. So I say that a morphism of curved algebras uh, is uh, an MC equivalence if for all curved coalgebras, let's call this F, if for all curved coalgebras C, the DG functor. So what I can do is I can look at HOM CF. So this is a curved algebra morphism between two convolution algebras. And I can apply MCDG to it. So this then becomes a functor of DG categories. And I want to say that the morphism is an MC equivalence uh, if this DG functor is a quasi equivalence. Uh, so you should think of this as some sort of DG category of maps from uh, omega C to F, uh, omega C to, to A or omega C to A prime. So loosely what this is saying is that um, all algebras of the form omega C uh, have the same DG categories of maps to uh, these two algebras via this algebra morphism. And there is a very, very symmetric definition for MC equivalences of curved coalgebras. Uh, right? It's uh, kind of hopefully you should be clear what to do. And then the main theorem. So, firstly, curved coalgebras has a model structure with weak equivalences are the MC equivalences and the co-fibrations are the injections. So that's pretty nice. Uh, it's even a even co-fibrantly generated. And two, uh, so that this is uh, this is again myself and Andre. Uh, the category of curved algebras has a again cofibrantly generated model structure with the weak equivalences. Again, these are the MC equivalences, and the vibrations. Well, in fact, the vibrations are all surjections, um, but there exist surjections that are not vibrations. So this is an inclusion, which is a strict, where this is a strict inclusion. Um, it's possible to, uh, to describe the vibrations explicitly. Um, I, I can tell you what they are if you're interested, um, but uh, so there's a little bit of a symmetry here uh, with the uh, kernel potent setting and also with the model structure on curved coalgebras. Um, and then, moreover, uh, and moreover, the extended Barco-Barra junction is a Quillen equivalence uh, between these um, model categories. Uh, as maybe a remark, it's actually fairly easy to see that if I take curve algebras and I just localize the weak equivalences to get an infinity category, and I take curved algebras and I localize uh, the MC equivalences to get an infinity category, it's actually not that hard to see that um, the extended barco bar junction is an equivalence of infinity categories. Um, the, the hard part of the theorem is actually proving that these categories admit model structures. And uh, the great advantage of model structures is they allow you very, very fine control over what's going on with your homotopy theory, rather than just taking the localization to an infinity category. Um, I think I will probably stop there. So we have a whole host of applications, um, including some uh, to deformation theory, 
uh, sort of constructions of various uh, non-commutative moduli spaces. Um, and yeah, we, we also prove a, a bunch of other sort of interesting results. So for example, curved coalgebra is symmetric monoidal, curved algebra is enriched over it. Um, we prove some compatibility results with usual conal potent causal duality. Uh, we prove some compatibility results with uh, Lazarev and Holstein's uh, categorical causal duality. And uh, yeah, some more things too. But yeah, no, thank you for uh, thank you for listening. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you, Matt. Um, can we all unmute ourselves and give the speaker a round of applause? So my camera is failing me now. Okay, if you have any questions for the speaker, ask them now. Any any questions? I see your hand. Okay, no, sorry, that's I need clapping. Right. I was wondering what a twisted did you say twisted complex or a twisted module? Um, I don't know the definition, I'm sorry, a twisted. Oh yeah, um, sure. So the, the definition is actually uh, pretty simple. So let's suppose a let's just go to the the DG world for now. So A is a DG algebra. A twisted module uh, is a DG A module whose underlying uh, well, so such that M. So such that when I forget the differential on M, so that means that's that's this notation, I forget the differential on M, this is isomorphic as an A module to V tensor A for some uh, vector space, or DG vector space even. DG vector space V. So twisted modules are precisely the modules such that when I forget the differential on everything, they are uh, exactly free A modules. Um, but then uh, the differential is allowed to be anything compatible with this. And uh, the space of well, a, a rank one twisted module, so one for which V is just the base field, um, is exactly the same thing as a Morikatan element in A. Right. Um, did you also say 